Though his days as a Beatle belong to another generation, it's a mantle he can never entirely shake. Today, music reporter Rona Elliott is here with the third part of her interview with the man they used to call the Baby Beatle. Good morning, Chan. It is hard to believe, but the official breakup of the Beatles was 16 years ago today. The legacy they left us, though, remains as strong and as magic as ever. Ringo, I hope to have enough money to go in, into a business of my own by the time we um, do flop. Has success changed your life? Yes. It was during those Beatle days that George Harrison first became involved in filmmaking. A Hard Day's Night, Help, and Yellow Submarine further established their artistic credentials, and his comedies helped define the kind of movie producer George Harrison would become with his own company, and made films. Their latest movie, Water, which deals with greed on a small Caribbean island, features a finale helped along by Ringo Starr and Eric Clapton, and would have fit nicely into the Beatle brand of irreverent humor. For many of us in our generation, our lives were defined by the years of your initial prominence. How have you managed not to be stuck in time to just keep your life going? I don't know. There's no other thing to do except, um, as the man said, the only thing I knew how to do was to keep on keeping on like a bird that flew. Anyway, you just keep going and uh, past, you know, the past is gone. That's another thing this guy who built my house said. Past is gone, uh, can't not that we call. Future is not, may not be at all. Present is, improve the flying hour, present only is within thy power. So, I mean, if that's all there is to it, there, there isn't anything, nothing exists except now. You know, the past is gone and the future doesn't exist until you get to it and then it's the now. So you just have to be here now and um, do your best. There are a number of private schools in New York now that alongside 16th century madrigals and Beethoven, they teach Beatles songs. Is that a tremendous stature for you? Well, it's nice, it's nice. But I mean, I think Beatles had its part and has its part in life just as everybody else does. Um, I don't think the Beatles was that bigger thing, you know, it was good, it was okay, but, um, you know, maybe being in them, uh, I saw it differently, you know, it was, I thought they wrote some nice tunes, and we made some nice records, and we had a, a laugh, and we tried to be as honest as possible, but, um, you know, I think if they're going to have Mozart and all them other people, might as well have the Beatles. In the better late than never department, just now, the Russians have put on sale. A Hard Day's Night, and A Taste of Honey, and 300,000 copies were sold immediately. Just on a, well, who knows, another 20 years they may get out of Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> you once said, actually you probably said it dozens and dozens of times, that the Beatles would have been just fine hanging around together if the press weren't around. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, everything we ever did, you know, um, just made the newspapers, it made, just made it very difficult, you know, and then if something, if you did have a row, instead of it just being a private row, it always got in the papers, and um, it just put us all in positions that opposed each other, and made it much more difficult to actually, um, you know, say, all right, forget it, you know, that was that, and, uh, you know, it made everything much bigger than it actually was. Was it hard to separate reality from what you were reading in the papers then, or not? Yeah, sometimes. Recently, you flew from Maui to Honolulu to see Julian Lennon perform. Was that exciting? I didn't, I didn't actually. No, it said that in the in the newspaper in in that <laughs> magazine. No, no, no. I forget that magazine what it's called. Uh, but they also said I like to just use this opportunity. I don't have a toilet that sings <laughs> Lucy in the Sky with diamonds that costs thirty nine dollars, whatever. It's absolutely rubbish, and I don't know where they got it from, but. Um, you know, so will they stop writing that, please? <laughs> we'll clarify that once and for all. The quote was $3,500. Yeah, was it? Well, I don't have it, yeah. And you didn't see Julian? No, I just called him on the phone. 
Can't go to Honolulu anymore, though, can you? From Maui or just in general? No, just because of Marcus. Oh, yes. Well, he, we heard that, that today that Marcus. he might be on his way. Well, he tried to kill us, President Marcus. Yes, but you want to review that? Yeah, well, we went to um, Manila back in the 60s, the Beatles on a tour, and uh, we did the concert. The next morning, we were in bed, and somebody knocked on our door, the hotel suite, saying, come on, you're supposed to be at the palace. And we said, no, we're not. We, weren't. we didn't have any engagement anywhere, but somebody had, you know, some smart guy had said, sure, I'll get the Beatles up to the palace. And they said, turn on the TV. We turned the television on, and there it was, this big palace with lines of people, and the guy saying, well, they're still not here yet. And we watched ourselves not arrive at the palace. But we were never supposed to be there. And so what they did was they said, Beatles snub first family, <laughs> which I'm glad we did. See, even in those days, we had taste. And, um, and so consequently, he set the mob on us and tried to beat us up, which they did. They beat up a lot of people in with us and wouldn't let the airplane leave Manila until Epstein, our manager, had to get off the plane and give back the money we earned at the concert. So that's what I think of Marcus, <laughs> old twat he was. <laughs> uh, tomorrow in our final part of our interview, George Harrison talks about his music and what he sees for his future. <laughs> so far, George has validated my own good taste, I should think. They He's were terrific. They were some good tunes. We'll be back after these messages.